Well, hello, everybody. Hello. It's been a while. Uh, hopefully this works. I want to let you know uh, I have had COVID for a while and I'm getting over. Let me try and fix that background there. Uh, I'm getting over it. And the issue I have right now is breathing. When I talk a lot, I start coughing. So I'm going to try to get <laughs> try to get through this. I've got my trusty inhaler somewhere. Here it is. <coughs> Let's do a preemptive puff. Hopefully that helps. All right. Um, what I wanted to do was, uh, oh, dude, skip. Don't start. No. Okay. We'll have to discuss that later. Skip. <coughs> <coughs> so. I am re recovering from COVID. The biggest problem I had is this weird cough. It's a dry cough. Um, I had one day of uh, of, of a uh, I'm like looking for a fever. Other than that, <coughs> this is it. This is the worst of it. <clears throat> if it gets to the point where I can't talk. I'll just cut it off and I'll try again later. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to do this live instead of creating a video. Um, because I want, I want, uh, I, I want everybody to know how kind of genuine and straightforward all this is. So if you have questions, you know, feel free to put them in the chat there. Um, let me see if there's a way, if you if you'd like to come on the, uh, stream, I'm going to put the link. If you have StreamYard, there you go for questions and stuff. All right. <clears throat> now, here's uh, and th and this is this is uh, you know how things have happened from my perspective. Okay, others might have a different idea of how everything went down. Um, I'm going to try and be as objective as I possibly can. Um, and to the to the beginning to to start that process, I'll tell you, I am not the driving force uh, behind any of this. Uh, I get a lot of credit, but um, what you're going to find out throughout this video is that um, I'm just a small part in a a very big push to. Uh, to get where we are starting <laughs> tomorrow where you no longer need a license in Texas to uh, carry a firearm. Uh, crap, me <coughs> <coughs> crap Metro. No, um, it's too late to get the Regeneron treatment. Um, I no longer have COVID. It, uh, I, I fought through it on my own. Um, I did vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc uh and some other stuff um and uh, got through it that way and now i'm just dealing with with the cough but i think with regeneron you have to have uh like get it within like three days of of coming down with go <laughs> with covid <laughs> <laughs> all right so here's here's how it all started uh you know um i've <laughs> I've always been uh, a gun rights advocate. I haven't been an activist, but I've been an advocate. And I remember earlier that year, 2013. So th this all starts in 2013, okay? And in 2013, I remember uh, <clears throat> attending a rally in Austin on February 23rd, 223, Gun Rights Day. So there we are in Austin, uh, kind of a, a gun rights. Hey guys, uh, we're trying to get, you know, at the time, I think it was SB 700 was the open carry bill at the time. And nobody really, really seemed to give a crap about that. And, and um, open carry failed <coughs> during the uh, 2013 session. So I go to this rally 
And it was, it, it was kind of a, you know, I was still active duty military. So it, uh, it really motivated me seeing all these people there with, um, you know, their rifles, their pistols. Well, at the time you couldn't see pistols, but everybody had their rifles, their shotguns, stuff like that, uh, on the Capitol grounds. Nobody got hurt. Nobody. Um, yeah, my wife caught it too, Zafarius. Uh, she got a little worse than I did. Like I said, all all that I've got is this this tightness in my chest. <clears throat> so, um, the city of this is all gonna come from memory. So I'm gonna try and do this uh, as best I can. But there was a town in Texas that had passed a resolution that um, was essentially going to make, uh, because this was during, uh, as you know, the Obama years, was going to make the town a Second Amendment sanctuary. And so I contacted uh, the people with responsible for that and I asked for a, a copy of that resolution because I was going to present it to my city council in Temple, Texas. So I got a copy of it. I took the resolution, you know, and I, and I, I had contacted the mayor and my, my city councilman about, Hey, uh, can we, can we uh, pass this resolution here in temple as well? And the response I got was, Oh, you know, CJ, we, we, uh, we support the second amendment here. We don't need this resolution. This is all nonsense. And, uh, it's just show it's not going to do anything. Um, dang it. My wife is calling me. Um, is there a way to, yeah. Um, <clears throat> And so I was like, okay, all right. So uh, they, they didn't want to do anything. So what I did was I decided, okay, I'm going to go to a city council meeting and I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to bring up the fact that, look, I presented this resolution. It's not a hard resolution. If you truly support the second amendment, then um, you will pass this, uh, this resolution that makes it official, puts it in writing. You know, it's one thing to say you support the second amendment and it's another to, actually put some skin in the game. So I go to the city council meeting <clears throat> and again, I'm kind of rebuffed. Nobody wants to do anything about it. Everyone's telling me how pro two way they are in temple, Texas. And we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, your rights are safe here, CJ. And so I had said, one of the things I had said, and I got, I got criticized about this um, as if it was some sort of uh, premonition or, you know, a threat. But I says, look, if you don't think, that people in this town care about gun rights, well, then I'll, I'll show you that people care about these gun rights. Not 10 days later, March 16th, 2013, I take my son on a hike. Okay. My son was working on his Eagle Scout uh, ranking, was trying to get his Eagle Scout, and he needed one more merit badge. That one merit badge was either hiking or swimming. And uh, or biking, hiking, biking or swimming was the one merit badge that he needed uh, required for his for, for his Eagle Scout. So uh, he decided to go hiking. I said, OK, well, I'll tell you what, um, just pick a because because the uh, scout has to pick, you know, the hiking route and all that kind of stuff. So just pick pick the route. Keep it close to home. You know, we can just hike around out here in the country in the middle of nowhere and uh, we'll, we'll do that. So he picks her out. <clears throat> the uh, at one point it, there we did cross a uh, a major road in in Temple, but it, you know this was a Saturday afternoon. And then later, had we been able to finish our hike, um, we would have hiked along a major road for probably about two miles as well. Um, and so, but other than that, we, we avoided, there, there were no, at the time there were no, uh, neighborhoods that we were walking through. There were no business areas we were walking through. It was all rural area. And, uh, you know, what happened that day is pretty well known. Um, literally halfway through the hike at about the uh, five mile mark, um, I hear behind me, hold up a minute. I turn around and there's a police officer there. Police officer doesn't have his lights on. Uh, he, you know, doesn't have his gun out. Uh, I've, you know, I'm still active duty military at the time. And I'm also a uh, federal law enforcement at the time. So I'm thinking I'm a federal agent. 
I'm thinking, okay, well, what's going on here? And uh, all I, I hear him say something, but I didn't understand what he had said. So I asked him to repeat himself. And he said, don't be touching it. And I was like, I looked down, there's my rifle. I'm like, okay, I'm not touching it. Obviously, I, I, as soon as I saw the cop, I put my hands uh, down to my side. And um, so he comes up and he grabs my rifle. He says, what are you doing? I said, we're hiking. He grabs my rifle and he says, hiking, huh? And as he's holding my rifle, he's like, uh, is there some reason why you've got this? And, um, you know, my favorite three words in life um, when it comes to tyrants is because I can't. I, I thought it was a really stupid question, right? All right. We all know what happened that day. I ended up getting arrested, went through this really uh, high profile case. Um, I was eventually uh, convicted on something I wasn't even arrested for. But... After I got arrested, I was contacted uh, by by Murdoch Pisgotti, and they run. He runs um, Don't Comply. So if you go to don'tComply.com, and um, he's like, "Hey, uh, you know, we want to hold a rally down there in Temple, Texas." And I was like, "Absolutely, man, that'd be awesome." So don't comply. Uh, you know, creates this event called Come and Take It Temple. And uh, it's on June, I want to say June 1st or June 4th is when uh, is when this happens. So June 1st or June 4th. And Murdoch Pisgotti and Matthew Short and uh, several other people um, hold this big giant rally. And at the rally, uh, there, there's some good speakers. Um, there's also... Um, uh, black rain ordinance is there now. I got to back up a little bit because between March and June was the, if I'm not mistaken, was the NRA convention in Houston. And I had gone, no, nope, no, that was later. That was later that year. Um, so black rain ordinance is there. And they, uh, you know, they offered, uh, they, they wanted to give me a rifle because, they thought, okay, we're a gun rights organization, or we're a, we're a gun company, right? Uh, here's this guy that's going through, you know, needs needs some um, needs some legal help and all that. You know, we could, yeah, we could throw money at him, and we could we could do this or whatever. But we're a gun company, and he had a gun taken by uh, by this thug cop, Ermis. So why don't we just offer him a gun? And literally. Uh, you know, so Black Rain Ordinance contacts me and they said, uh, hey, you know, CJ, we'd like to replace your your rifle that was taken. I said, well, you know, I really appreciate that. I really do. But I, I just want my rifle back. And and I know I'm going to get my rifle back. I'm not worried about that. So, I mean, really, I do appreciate I, I, I truly appreciate it. And the next time I need a rifle, just because you, at, you know, you offered, I will buy one from from Black Rain Ordinance. Well, they Black Rain was adamant. And and I, and I didn't want to, you know, just. I mean, here, here's somebody trying to support me. Uh, I didn't want to just say no. So I says, well, I'll tell you what. Can I build one for my wife? Um, because I know I'm going to, you know, be building my own ARs and I'm going to be, and I've got my own ARs. I've got several. Um, and I really just wanted my AR back. And they're like, yeah, okay, let, let, we'll build one for your wife. They literally threw the, uh, not threw, but they, they gave me the catalog, their catalog. Um, and they said, all right, build it. You tell us. What you want, uh, you know, from pins and, and springs to to barrel. And so I built my wife this. She, look, the honest thing is my wife has the best rifle in the house. Thanks to Black Rain Ordinance. Um, so they were there at this rally on uh, June. I, I want to say it was June 1st, 2013. So we have this rally and I show up and there are probably 400 people at at this rally uh, to support my case and uh, Murdoch Murdoch and others. Ah, oh, dang it. Why is my realtor calling me right now? Um, so, you know, Murdoch raises a little bit of money for my defense um, cause I'm still dealing with uh, the criminal case and they raise some money for me. And, and I, and, and we start talking because here we've got 400 armed Texans in Temple, Texas. Why? Because one guy got harassed and arrested 
for literally not breaking the law. Uh, it was for pissing off the police. Now, what really drove me nuts was, um, you know, all of these law-abiding citizens came to Temple, Texas uh, to exercise their rights, show support for the Second Amendment and, and for my case. Well, every single officer in the area was on duty and present in Temple, Texas that day. They were manning rooftops. They were at street corners. They were patrolling all over the place. We had, uh, obviously, Bell County. You had Temple. Um, I think they got help from Belton and Colleen. I'm not sure. We had the Department of Public Safety troopers there. FBI. Department of Homeland Security was there. Um, I feel like I'm missing something. ATF. ATF was there. And, and they're in marked and unmarked vehicles. They're, uh, they're, they're literally positioned on every, just about every rooftop in downtown Temple. It looked like a war zone. It's like, holy cow. We've got legally armed citizens bringing guns to Temple. We've got to squash that. Um, it Obviously, there was no issue. Um, we had the rally. And uh, did a, they did a march <clears throat> and we left, right? So I started talking to Murdoch and started talking to uh, some other guys uh, from uh, Don't Comply. And we were talking about, hey, you know, um, we need to turn this into something because obviously people care about this, you know, to bring to bring 400 people to Temple, Texas and in 2013. Uh, armed with rifles to kind of show, look, uh, you know, you might be able to harass one man on the side of the road, uh, but try to harass 400 of us it was a big deal, especially for the small town of Temple. <coughs> for those of you just joining, I'm uh, <coughs> I'm overcoming COVID and I still have this cough. So forgive me. So, um, what we did was after the event, we uh, we got together and created Open Carry Texas. Um, I had I I'd actually right after that event, uh, I thought I went and I purchased the name and the URL and, and all that kind of stuff and uh, worked with Murdoch and those other guys to um, to create this and. What what <coughs> what we would <coughs> oh come on what we would do is have rallies all around the state uh, where you know because now everybody is carrying rifles everywhere all around Texas. Uh, <coughs> Corey, no, it's the after effects of COVID. <coughs> I have a uh, nifty little, why is that not? Inhaler. Let's hope that works. Uh, so um, the idea was, you know, we, we would stand up to tyrants all around the state and uh, we didn't get open carry uh, HB 700, I think is what it was in 2013. And so we decided, okay, we're going to form this organization and we're going to fight it. No, no vaccine. I did not, I did not get the vaccine. I'm relying on my natural immunity, vitamins, minerals. Uh, and so we would go to whenever, as, as everybody started carrying these rifles to try and get, um, to try and get uh, open carry passed and make a point that Hey, look, we can carry these rifles everywhere, but uh, you can't carry a pistol openly or you're, you're, you're going to be a criminal. <clears throat> and as more people started doing this, of course, more people uh, started getting arrested. And, and what we would do is we would show up and we would the, the name of our rallies would be like, come and take it, San Antonio. Or, uh, and, and so, so we kind of kept that whole uh, theme for a long time. Eventually, you know, I was trying to create 
a, a, a specific type of an organization. I wanted Open Carry Texas to be a, uh, an organization that had respect that um, when, you know, we said something, people listened, um, we had integrity and that kind of stuff. Am I looking kind of blue here? Let me fix this. Let's, let's see if I change my light a little bit here. Uh, what's going on here? There we go. Let's try that. And now that's a crappy light. Why is that not working? That makes me look dark. Yep, sorry. That's that's the blue I got. That's the best light I got. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I really wanted it to be a professional organization. I, and um, there were a lot of conflicts uh, within the, the people who were leading and, and starting up Open Carry Texas. And, and at one point, it just got to a boiling point. Um, and, and really it got to a boiling point because what a lot of people don't realize is uh, in 2013, I hit major depression. I was not as happy as uh, I probably made it look like in public. Um, I had a huge relapse in my uh, my PTSD uh, from everything that was going on because, you know, here's a guy I've never been in trouble in my life, never had any problems, um, never broken the law, you know, and I, I'm not talking about like speeding tickets or anything like that, but, um, you know, I've had a good career. I had a good life, never been in trouble. And all of a sudden here I am, I'm, I'm thrown in jail for something I didn't do. Uh, there was a lot of hate coming my way. There was also a lot of love coming my way. You know, I got a lot of support more than I deserve. Um, but a whole lot of support, but it also came with a whole lot of just vitriol. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing how many people, uh, how many of my friends turned on me in 2013 and, uh, it sent me into a major depression. Now my, my own dad, well, my stepdad, uh, my, the one that raised me, you know, we, we had a falling out over this, this whole arrest and stuff. And so it was both a good thing and a bad thing, but I was going through a major, major depression. I ended up, um, you know, nearly destroying my marriage. And the only reason I probably didn't destroy my marriage is because I married an awesome woman that quite frankly is above me. And, uh, any, any other woman would have, uh, rightfully left me in 2013. Um, I won't get into a lot of the specifics. Uh, let, let's just say I, I tried to completely destroy my entire life. Uh, a lot of people don't know this either, except for some people, some of y'all might know is that in 2013, I tried to commit suicide because of all this. Um, you know, looking back, it's a little bit different. I don't quite understand it. Uh, I was just in a bad place. You know, here, here I am being thrust into the, the public spotlight that I didn't ask for. Everything I do is under a microscope. The army turned on me. I had been uh, a stellar soldier. I mean, I was, I was on orders <clears throat> when this happened. I was on orders to go to Fort Huachuca, Arizona and take over as the sergeant major or the commandant of the military intelligence school there. I was going to be the leading uh, person at the uh, the military intelligence school in Fort Huachuca. And uh, I was going places, you know, I had a really good career. Well, guess what? Those, those orders had to get canceled. They got canceled because here I am now under arrest. And now I've got, uh, you know, commanders telling me that me standing up to that officer on the side of the road uh, was, was, didn't sh shine a good light on um, the military. Me, me going all around the state, carrying my rifle everywhere and, and causing problems was bringing a bad name to the, the army. All of a sudden I was a dirt bag. Like after, let's see, 2013. So after 18 years of service, suddenly I'm a dirt bag because I stood up for my rights. And that's why I kind of got into this depression because it, it wasn't just the system, the, the, the legal system that was coming after me. Um, but it was, it was, you know, the army was coming after me. So there were a lot of, uh, reasons for there, there was a lot of tension in open carry Texas and the board and, and everything. And, and I, my perception, okay. My perception, right or wrong. 
was that the the rest of the board wasn't taking as seriously what I was trying to do. Um, you know, I wanted to be a professional organization that, yeah, we we did the the rallies and the protests, um, but we also did legislative stuff. And, and, you know, we would have a name that people would would be willing to get associated with. But there were others that really just wanted to sort of antagonize and they wanted to, um, in my opinion, you know, they, they wanted to just do the the whole show up and, uh, you know, kind of throw it in everybody's face. And so there, there there was this this conflict. And also I was trying to get, you know, through the IRS and I was trying to get all these this paperwork done so that we were uh, so that we were legit, legit. Uh, so that we could get a tax free status. And I and I felt like nobody on the board was taking this seriously now. Looking back, okay, looking back, I'm going to say part of this was my problem. Part of this, I think a great deal of it actually falls on me because I was falling apart. And I, was, I think I was trying to project onto other people. But anyway, what ended up happening was Open Carry Texas split. Um, it was me and then it was Come and Take It Texas. So uh, Open Carry Texas split into Open Carry Texas and um, essentially come and take it, Texas. And then, um, from there, uh, there were different splits as well. Now at the same time throughout this year, um, you know, there were other, other groups that were popping up that, uh, were, were doing things a little bit differently. So Texas carry Terry, um, my buddy, Terry was, uh, leading Texas carry and, uh, he, he's more, involved in the, in the political realm of things. And so now you've got, you know, out of the blue, because look, the TSRA at the time, the Texas State Rifle Association and the NRA uh, were doing nothing. As a matter of fact, let me tell you, let me back up even more. So going back to my case, I had contacted the NRA because, uh, you know, we were looking for, for help on, on our case and they have a, obviously a legal defense fund and stuff like that. So I contacted the NRA my attorney did. And the NRA says, yeah, I'll tell you what, look, we're, we're not going to get involved, but if you, if this ends up going to, you know, if you have to appeal, then we'll definitely, we'll step in, you know, in the, in the appellate process and help with that. Well, guess what? We ended up going to appeal, went to the NRA. They didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, also around that time, the NRA was saying that uh, us open carriers were downright weird and the NRA was attacking us. So, that's why all these other little groups started popping up. That's why Open Carry Texas popped up. Uh, Come and Take It Texas popped up. Texas Carry popped up. Um, I'm trying to think of what others there were. And then you had little, you know, smaller groups. So, for example, uh, Open Carry Tarrant County um, was initially a part of, uh, you know, that group was a part of Come and Take It Texas. And they ended up getting booted um, because Corey Watkins was sort of an, uh, out of control guy and was not helping the cause in any way whatsoever. And so I tried to bring uh, Open Carry Tarrant County under our wing, under Open Carry Texas, and try to sort of legitimize uh, what, what they were doing, you know, and, and get them into doing things in a way that was productive. You know, my thought was if we're going to do something as an organization, there needs to be a reason for it anything that we do. So for example, like we were carrying rifles into Walmart, we were carrying rifles into Target, uh, Home Depot, Starbucks. And it, and it got to the point where I thought, you know, what, what, okay, yeah, this is cool. We're making a point, but to what end? What's the, what's the end game of taking rifles into all these places? And what we decided to do was back off of the rifles and go towards the black powder revolvers because we thought okay we're trying to get people uh comfortable seeing open carry we're trying to get open carry of handguns passed so let's move to uh let, let's move to this you know model of carrying these black powder revolvers because you can carry those legally and openly because they're not considered uh firearms under the law so we start doing that and and this is you know, we're, we're coordinating with uh, Texas Carry, Come and Take a Texas. Even though we had split, we still had a pretty decent relationship 
with uh, now not op open carry Tarrant County. We ended up booting them as well. I think within like 30 days or 60 days, we ended up booting them because they didn't want any accountability. Um, you know, they wanted to raise money off of the open carry Texas name. And, and I, we didn't have any problem with that and we didn't want any of it, but we needed to be able to track it because by that time uh, we were already a nonprofit. And so if, if people are going to collect money using the open carry Texas name, we at least needed to have oversight on it, on how much was brought in, how much was spent, what it was spent on, because there are rules about it. Well, Corey Watkins um, didn't want to follow those rules. You know, he wanted to be a free man and, uh, and and just be a complete moron. So we ended up getting rid of Open Carry Tarrant County, just like Come and Take It Texas did. Um, and then uh, so, but but we still all work together. Uh, us Come and Take It Texas, Texas Carry. I feel like I'm missing somebody. This is what happens when I, I just try to do this stuff off the cuff. And. Uh, you know, we decided let's let's try to transition to these black powder revolvers. Well, that created a whole other problem because, of course, cops don't understand the difference between a black powder revolver and regular rifles. So our throughout 2013, throughout 2014, we uh, the the idea was to carry rifles, um, you know, when, when whenever it didn't matter. We still did it, but we stopped going to um, we stopped going to like places like Walmart and Target to open carry rifles because it, it 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 didn't further our interest it didn't do what we were trying to do it kind of backfired it actually gave us a lot of bad publicity and it took us about six months to really understand how the media fit into all this and so we transitioned to the uh the handguns and we also started working with in in 2014 started working with all of the candidates for office and explaining uh hey look we want to get open carry passed um and, and here's here's why we carry our guns. And we were able to get the message out that the reason we're carrying rifles is because we can't carry pistols. And by the time we're able to open carry pistols, at least people will stop carrying their rifles. They'll start openly carrying their pistols. And, you know, a, a lot of these idiots will be just happy. Oh, at least they're not carrying rifles anymore. They're just carrying pistols. Um, and that was our that was our goal. Our goal was to get people used to seeing guns in public so that when handguns got passed on open carry now keep in mind we're also fighting at the same time we're also fighting still for unlicensed carry like we were fighting for unlicensed carry when we were fighting for open carry um there was just no appetite whatsoever those bills went nowhere uh, in 2015 they they just they died a horrible death almost like the uh, open carry bill did and so we uh you know, we started working with politicians, started working with the candidates, started building momentum. Now, at the same time, here's a funny story. So we're getting ready to move into the uh, legislative session in 2015. And uh, I get a call from uh, Charles Cotton of the NRA and um, what's her name of TSRA. Uh I can't remember what her name was at the time. Um, she'd been there forever. Anyway, I get a call. We have this conference call. And it's about open carry. And what what the NRA is trying to tell me to do is to back off. All right. Hey, CJ, this is literally what he said. You guys have gotten this to the point where open carry is an issue. Uh, so, um, you know, y'all can stop now. We'll take it from here. And we're going to, yeah, trip, trip. There you go. Linda trip. Uh, not Linda. It's uh, Alice, Alice trip. And so, uh, you know, they're like, back off. We got this, you know, stop doing your rallies. Stop doing your open carry events. You're, you're only hurting the cause. You made this an issue. It's never been an issue before. We, we can get it passed if, if you back off. Hell no. If we're the ones... <laughs> That made it an issue we're the ones going to bring it across the finish line now what the nra did was made sure that we had a fairly watered down bill uh and uh so 2015 comes we're all in there you've got the tsra now 
fighting for open carry. You've got the NRA fighting for open carry. You've got open carry Texas. Come and take it, Texas. Texas carry. Um, Texas Firearms Coalition, which was uh, where uh, Rachel Malone was uh, was a part of. So you've got Rachel Malone now. Uh, we've got Terry. Um, oh my gosh, I am names are killing me right now. Uh, Terry, Rachel, me, Murdoch. Unfortunately, Corey. Corey almost killed open carry with his antics in 2015. Um, but <coughs> bottom line is with all of these groups coming together, these grassroots organizations, um, we were able to get open carry passed in 2015. The very first legislative session that all of these groups have sprung up on very smart individuals. Um, and, and, and very respected individuals that are involved in this fight. And so with the exception of Corey, sorry. Yeah. Terry Holcomb is who I'm talking about. Uh, and, and I don't mean to keep ragging on Corey, but damn it. He made our job hard. He made our job so incredibly hard, um, because he's all about me, 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 me. And he wasn't about what we were trying to accomplish. And he, and he didn't understand how you have to use the process. Uh, so 2015, we had open carry pass. We did not get anything unlicensed carry. <coughs> if, if you go back and listen, if you go back and listen to all the testimony, I mean, we're, you know, while we're trying to get open carry passed, we're all making, you know, telling the legislators, get rid of the license. We don't want the license. All right. This is a great step forward, but, uh, you know, we shouldn't have to beg for a license. There's, I think at the time there were, uh, 30, 30 states, something like that, or 32 states that allowed for open carry without a license. Keep in mind also, When open carry Texas started in 2013, there were five constitutional carry states, five. By the end of the 2015 legislature, there were, it was either eight or 10. Uh, Felix, it's, I, uh, I had COVID. I've overcome COVID. I no longer have COVID, but I'm dealing with the, uh, and for those of you who just joined us, I'm dealing with the, uh, issues with my lungs as a result of having COVID. So I've got this cough and talking a lot uh, makes me cough a little bit. So I've got some water here. I've got my inhaler. I'm going to try and make it through this. Uh, All right. 2015. So (coughs) we didn't get, (coughs) golly. I'm sorry. I should probably put a video up or something. Uh, we didn't get our unlicensed carry stuff, but we we had we had laid the foundation for getting it passed later. Okay, it had been 20 years since con- uh, concealed carry was passed. 20 years. In 20 years from 96 or 95 to 2015, uh, nothing had been done in Texas. Nothing. We got little things here and there. You know, you got the uh, Motorist Protection Act. Oh, good. You get to carry in your, wife, in your car without, without a license. Um, you know, little things here and there that were, were just senseless, useless, nonsense. Uh, just little, 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 oh, here's a little bit of your freedom back. Here's a little bit of your freedom back. And all of a sudden, now you've got all of these organizations out there, these great people um, who uh, are standing up. And, and, and let me back up. Not only do you have people like, you know, Rachel Malone, Murdoch Pizgotti, uh, Matthew Short, uh, Terry Holcomb, 
me, I, I'm not anybody, um, and others, but you've got a Richard Briscoe, uh, who's a freaking amazing dude. Uh, one of the most intelligent guys I know. Um, but we've got thousands of you out there that now are able to go and, and they, they've got, a everybody's got a little bit of direction. We've always wanted this, but you know, how do we get it? And now we've got a, we've got a, a path and people were showing up at rallies. People were showing up at protests. People were showing up to testify. Um, people, people, oh, what's going on there? People were showing up. And, and that's what made it happen was the involvement of Texans. <clears throat> In August of 2013, you know, we brought 1,200 people to the Alamo, 1,200 armed people to the Alamo. That's more people armed at the Alamo than any time in history. Even at the Battle of the Alamo, there weren't 1,200 people there with guns. And uh, so Jerry Patterson was there to help us. Uh, we had some great speakers. Uh, the Oath Keepers were there. Um, Alex Jones was there. <laughs> and, you know, it, it helped us make that point. We had... Uh, between 2013, 2015, about 250 or so rallies and protests around the, around the state. Um, the first six months of our existence, we had 24 arrests for open carry. Every single one of them had charges dismissed except mine. Um, and we continued to fight for this. So, so after 2015, uh, you know, open carry Texas, we were like, well, do we need to change our name? What, you know, because uh, we got open carry, but that's not what we've always just been about. We've always been about trying to get uh, the government out of the business of licensing away our rights um, and making us, uh, making us get a permission slip. So between 26, 2015, 2017, <clears throat> we transitioned from carrying <coughs> ah, man, this sucks. Ah, this sucks. Not being able to breathe all the time. From carrying rifles to carrying our handguns. Um, and now the point was to move from focusing on open carry to getting unlicensed carry passed. Um, we uh, continued to do... <coughs> <coughs> our, <coughs> our main focus during that time was after the open carry bill was passed... Um, there was new signage requirements. Uh, obviously, the left was going around telling people to put up these signs. They were lying. You had Moms Demand Action going around uh, lying to um, these people that in order to ban open carry, they also had to ban concealed carry. You know, they had to put up uh, both the signs when that wasn't the case. And so we sent out our legion of people and started targeting uh, these businesses that had put up these signs, these 30 dot six and seven signs, and started educating the public about what they can and cannot, you know, wh what they wh what they needed to put up and what they didn't need to put up. And, you know, some people just wanted to ban open carry <clears throat> for whatever reason. And so we were able to get a lot of 30 out six signs taken down a lot um hundreds of 30 out six signs came down that the left had convinced a lot of these businesses to put up um through lies and misinformation because uh, they were telling them well if you want to if you want to ban open carry you got to put up a 30 out six and 30 out seven sign 
And uh, they were even providing the signs for these uh, for these businesses. And so we would have to come up behind them and actually educate the businesses. So we spent two years uh, on an education campaign. Um, and by 2017, which is four years after we were founded, the number of constitutional carry states had gone from just five to, I want to say 13, okay, almost 15. So almost a 300% increase. <clears throat> um, and here we are still messing with licenses. Uh, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't take my inhaler that much. Although I have during this, if I OD on it and I pass out, just call 911. Um, just type it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we transitioned to more of an educational, uh, thing, trying to get everybody educated about what, what really uh, was going on around the country. Uh, what does unlicensed carry look like? What does it mean? Why do we need it? What's the point of it? Um, meanwhile, the NRA is trying to undermine us left, right, and sideways. And the way they did that in 2017 was, and 2019 was by passing these stupid ass bills that, uh, cause you know, one of our arguments about, uh, about the license was that it was so damn expensive for a couple to get a license in Texas. It was $500 to get a license. Um, and it's, it, it was just insane. And so, you know, the NRA, instead of fighting this idea that we shouldn't have licenses at all, what they did was they fought to reduce the, the cost of license, which, you know, we're not opposed to that. Obviously we're not opposed to, uh, having a, a, a lower cost because there should be no cost, uh, quite frankly. And, um, but, but the idea, the reason the NRA did that was to undermine our argument that licenses unfairly, uh, restricted the poor and the disadvantaged from being able to exercise their rights. Cause you had to pay all this money and really, really it, it, it stopped a lot of people from, from, from being able to carry when you have to pay $500 for a couple or $250, uh, per person to get a damn license. And, uh, that's why we didn't get, uh, open care or, uh, unlicensed carry in, um, 2017, 2019. Well, in, in, in 2017, we had this issue where, uh, you know, or I'm sorry, 2019, we had this issue where we were poised. We had a bill. We had uh, pretty good bills. We had good, good sponsorship support. Um, and the wonderful Speaker of the House, Joe Strauss, picks uh, cocaine poncho. Navarez to be the chair of the committee hearing the uh, the gun bills, which is the uh, public safety and homeland security, homeland security and public safety uh, committee. And Poncho is about the most anti-gun. He'll tell you he's not, but he's about one of the most anti-gun people there in the legislature. Um, so we've got these bills. Uh, they're scheduled for a hearing. I'm trying to remember in 2017, did we actually have, I think we had the hearing, but we didn't get the vote. If I'm not mistaken. It wasn't scheduled for a vote. <laughs> no, there was a hearing because I went there and I talked to Poncho. And, uh, and so the reason for that was because our good friend, Corey showed up again. And look, the, the, the truth is the people responsible for not getting, uh, unlicensed carry in 2015, 2017, 2019 were the politicians, period, in this story. Um, however, there were people like Corey who gave the politicians excuses. Uh, he had stuck his foot in Pancho Navarro's door, um, refused to leave. Um, it, it, he just created this huge scene and uh, gave gave Poncho a reason to, uh, I mean, it was so bad, even Republicans 
were walking around the Capitol with these little pens on that said, I am Pancho Navarez. And, uh, you know, trying to stand in solidarity with this dude because some idiot was out there just being a complete moron. All right. Um, and, and, it was, and it became the scapegoat. And that's why uh, we didn't get it in, in, earlier than that, or 2019. Now, also behind the scenes, we had senators and representatives telling us in secrecy that, hey, look, guys, um, you know, Governor Abbott is pushing against this constitutional carry bill. Uh, he's pretty much threatening senators. And <coughs> and pressuring senators not to pass the bill. Um, and that was the first indication we had in 2017 that one of the reasons we weren't getting constitutional carry was because of Greg Abbott. Greg Abbott was against it. He was telling politicians, um, you know, not to vote for it privately. And then publicly he was saying, ah, you know, if he would, he used this, uh, sleight of hand. Oh, if it gets to my desk, I'll vote for it. That's what he's telling us <coughs> <coughs> publicly. Well, privately he was saying, don't get it to my desk. And that's what, uh, Strauss and Patrick did. They, uh, they helped to make sure that the bill never made it to where it was supposed to go. Strauss put Pancho Navarez in charge of that committee and uh, the rest is history. Finally, 2021, uh, you know, we get a, a decent speaker of the house. Um, he creates or puts a, a good person in charge of the, uh, the committee and finally we get, you know, where we are, but it took eight years. It took eight years and it, and it could have only taken four years had Greg Abbott gotten out of the way. Had Greg Abbott not influenced the senior leadership in the House and the Senate, we could have had unlicensed carry <laughs> In twenty seventeen. Yeah, in twenty seventeen. So uh that's you know, we could have had this four years ago. I want to look at something here real quick. <clears throat> um I don't have it. Dang it. Let's see if this works. I'm going to put a video in here. If I can find it. Sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, nope. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try another one. Let's see if that works. I'm going to go and refill my water real quick. I'm going to take a quick break because um, I'm starting to get, and I don't, I can't take any more puffs out of my inhaler because I'll end up uh, hurting myself. So stand by one second. And when I come back, when I come back, um, I'm going to talk about, the fight in, this year and last year and how we got to where we were. And then, um, and, and, and that's really, that's really what I want to do is give a history of, of all the people that, that made it possible. Um, <clears throat> because in 2019, I was there for that session. Uh, but I started law school at the end of 2019. And then of course, in 2020, I, I, I've been in law school, not able to do much. And then 2021, uh, I wasn't there for uh, the legislative session. And so uh, I want to talk about 
the fact that there are so many other people who uh, worked really hard to make this happen and um, recognize them and tell you a little bit about how the gun rights uh, movement from 2017 to 2021 sort of shifted and how we finally started getting some national support. I'm going to play this video while I go and get my water. I'll be right back. McKinney okay. 911, what is the address to your emergency? Yeah, on um, 380 in McKinney, there's a group of people carrying um, signs and um, carrying guns saying, come take it, and they're yelling. And they got okay. guns in broad daylight. Okay, the, there is an open carry uh, demonstration going on right now. We are aware of it, and police are going by to keep an eye to make sure everything's peaceful. Like when you say they're okay. yelling, are they yelling directly at people or just kind of freedom of speech? Like, come take it, come take it, come take it. Okay. Come take it. But they're not yeah. making direct threats at people? Uh, I see them looking at the highway when they're saying come take it. So, I mean. Okay, because I know there's like, a, I mean, like I said, I know there's a demonstration going on. Um, okay. I mean, do you feel that you need to speak to an officer or anybody like that or? Because like I said, we are I mean, we are I going just, through there right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, if they can, if they can, um, they can, um, basically, I mean, if they're demonstrating, they're demonstrating. But mm -hmm. I mean, like, when you have, a, you know, what I'm saying, saying, "Come take it." That's where, like, you're um, implying a threat, and I feel okay. threatened when I see that sign, "Come take it." Okay, because because I know it's in a way. I, yeah. I'm sure they're probably trying to say, "Come take it," trying to take away their rights to bear arms. Yeah, is, I don't mind you, you okay. carrying it, but come take it. That seemed like you're going a little bit too far, so. I mean, if they're in the law, then that's cool. Then, okay. You know. All right. If, all right. if you see anything else, I'll like they're the actually, door, yeah. yeah, if they're actually like picking out people, trying to, like, seem like they are being more threatening. I know yeah. a bunch of people with guns. I just feel a little, kind of little scared because I got loved ones at the college right now studying, okay. and it's like, you know, as okay. long as they're like, you know, peaceful, and you, know, you guys know about it, then that makes me feel a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, we are aware, and we're, we're making sure okay. to check on them regularly. Okay. All okay. right. Well, thank you, ma'am. No problem. All right. Sir. Thanks. Bye. Oh goodness. That uh that phone call always cracks me up. It always cracks me up. <clears throat> so I thought I thought you'd like to hear that. Um freaking calling and saying that, oh my gosh, she's got a flag that says come and take it, and they're they're shouting, come and take it. What are we gonna do? All right. So <clears throat> one of the great things about uh so from 2017 to 2021, we started getting all this. Well, we, we've always had national attention. Um, but the problem, my O2 is good. Don't worry about my O2. I'm at 95, 96%. Um, I keep an O2 sensor, so I'm good. Don't worry. I was going to say I was looking for my O2 sensor, but uh, I think it's in the living room right now. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me tell you something. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this flat out. If, if I had to give, if I had to pick one person that is mostly responsible for, uh, I shall say two people. Cause I can't, I really can't say one person, two people that are responsible for getting to the point where we're going to be tomorrow where, uh, we're going to be able to, or actually even tonight at midnight, uh, that we're going to be able to exercise our second amendment rights without having to get a government permission slip. The two people that are responsible for making this happen and getting us to where we are today, uh, believe it or not, I'm not one of them. It's Richard Briscoe and Rachel Malone. Those are the two individuals who uh, have kicked ass, have done everything they could to influence people and make friends. And you do that by building relationships with the very people who have to pass these bills. It sucks that we have to beg politicians uh, to remove barriers to freedom. But, but the reality is, is that politicians have the ability uh, to kick your ass through use of the police state, throw you in a cage. Um, and you know, whether it's constitutional or not, uh, they're the ones that make your life hard through these laws. So <clears throat> <coughs> it's, uh, 
if anybody understands the importance of working with politicians, as despicable as it is, Rachel Malone and Richard Briscoe are the two people that that do that. And so they spent a lot of time, um, you know, gaining support, talking one on one with these legislators, talking with legislative aides, meeting with people on both sides of the aisle um, and working hard for the last four years. Now, Rachel uh, was able to. Oh, really? Shoot. Thank you. Thank you for that, James. Um, Rachel ended up uh, with the uh, Republican Party of Texas, you know, trying to work within the party to get uh, to, to get our legislative priorities passed of constitutional carry. And she did a really good job there. Um, she was eventually <laughs> fired, which I think is the best thing that could have happened to her. Because then gun owners of America hired Rachel as the Texas liaison. And I think that is what changed the course and the direction uh, of getting this thing passed uh, in Texas. Because now, instead of just these little groups that, you know, it just popped up in, 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 the, in recent years, um, now you've got a national organization that's putting their power behind this legislation. Because the NRA wasn't fighting for unlicensed carry. You know, the NRA was like, ah, well, you know, obviously, well, we support it, you know, but but they weren't endorsing it. Uh, it's one thing to say, I support it. It's another to say, to endorse it, to actually do something to get it passed. And now we have Rachel Malone, who is has got the name, the power, the weight, the money, the influence of gun owners of America behind her because she is now the GOA rep for Texas. That made all the difference. And after 2019, um, you know, she is kicking ass. Uh, Rick is kicking ass as the essentially the uh, li liaison for I keep hearing a noise out here. Okay. I don't know what that was. Anyway, here's my O2 sensor. Um, and so now you've got the, uh, the power the money, the weight and the influence of gun owners of America, um, helping open carry Texas and, um, and other grassroots groups to get this legislation passed. And I think that's what the, you know, that's what we needed. We needed, the legitimacy of a national organization coming together to to fight for this. Let's see where my O2 is right now. I'm uh, I've got my O2 sensor on. Oh, that's not good. I'm at about 89. Okay, 90. So, I guess I got to watch myself. <clears throat> slow down a little bit. Yeah, I'm at 90%. Um, probably because I'm talking a lot. Um, so I should probably end it here pretty soon. But <clears throat> with Rachel Malone working with GOA, with Richard Briscoe and his just encyclopedic brain working together in concert to get <coughs> constitutional carry passed. <coughs> <coughs> Did the trick. Um, hey, thank you, Matt. But here's the thing. What Rick and Rachel did was not just, I mean, cause they're two people, but they got you involved. 
they made sure they made sure that um, you know people knew when the hearings were. They made sure that uh, people knew when the votes were going to be, when people needed to call, when people needed to email, and <clears throat> Texans rose up and uh, he did that advice. But it was thanks to uh, all those people. So here's here's um, let me let me just try and look. I'm going to leave some people out. I know I am, and I'm going to feel really bad about it. Um, and I wonder if I should even do this and start naming as many people as I possibly can. I think I've named a lot of the main, uh, at least leaders. Okay. And yeah, exactly what this Texas Freedom Force said. It was, you know, Rick and Rachel by themselves could not have done anything if people weren't showing up to testify. If, um, if people weren't making phone calls, if people weren't sending emails, if people weren't visiting their legislators, if people uh, weren't going out and talking to the media, <clears throat> um, it's the combined power of all of those people doing what they did that made this possible. And I'm just thankful because I've been out of the loop for the last couple of years uh, trying to get through this law school that there were people willing to continue to step forward and take a leadership position and uh, <clears throat> get this cross the finish line. Now, it's not perfect. There's still some things that uh, we need to fix. <clears throat> and, oh, yeah, yeah. Left out getting tased, didn't I? Um, oh, there's a lot I left out. But I really just wanted to kind of hit the highlights of uh, of, uh, of everything that happened. I mean, look, uh, in 2013, on Veterans Day, uh, we took about 40 veterans to the Capitol to protest all of the arrests that had happened. Because um, remember, we, we were started in uh, 2013 in June. <clears throat> By November, we had had 24 arrests for open carry. And so I got a bunch of veterans together and we went to the Capitol to on Veterans Day to protest the fact that, you know, the, these people had uh, dedicated th their lives as Oath Keepers um, to the preservation of liberty. And, and they we had uh, taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution. And. Uh, so we we denounced that that oath and that sacrifice um, was being shit on by so many law enforcement departments around the state. Well, what ended up happening was DPS didn't like us being there. So they came up and uh, ended up arresting me. And I think was there someone else or was it just me? I think two of us got arrested that day. Uh, for because we refused to leave, you know, the, the DPS troopers told us, oh, you know, we couldn't have any any guns on the Capitol grounds. Well, there's no law that says that we brought guns on Capitol grounds for years. What all of a sudden they want to make a rule because people are actually doing it. And so we refused to leave. And all we did was we asked, hey, what's your authority? What, what authority do you have to tell us to leave? And instead of just responding, they arrested us for uh, resisting arrest and um criminal trespass. Now, of course, that was thrown out. <clears throat> and we continued to go to places like, uh, you know, down south along the border, Laredo, went to Amarillo, uh, San Angelo, uh, Beaumont. You know, anytime somebody's rights were being violated, we, we would go there. And then, of course, Almost Park picked up around 2018. Some of the First Amendment activists were having issues down there, but not only... But a lot of it was because of uh, the fact that they were open carrying. And so um, we decided to go down to Olmos Park and find out what was going on down there. Uh, they had an ordinance that every other city, uh, well, San Antonio, had had decided that it's unenforceable because we had contacted them and let them know that, hey, your ordinance that uh, 
says you can't carry a rifle loaded um, in public is unlawful. It, it's against state law. And Almost Park was the only department that uh, basically said F you. And we went down there. And of course, I wanted to see what was going on because we had planned a rally to support these guys who look when, when you're out there with a sign because uh, they, they had got, they had one arrest. Um, it was uh, a South Side slacker. Uh, they, they had harassed these guys and um, didn't really, I don't think they got arrested, but they got harassed, you know, and disarmed and they ran their name and ran their guns and all that kind of stuff. A lot of unconstitutional crap. So then they go out there with a sign, you know, a little bit later and the sign says, you know, almost park police department now hiring um, tyrants, thugs, and liars or something like that. So here you have Jack Miller holding this sign and a almost park police department, a police officer pulls up and gets out of his car with his gun drawn his gun drawn, ordering Jack to put his sign, to drop the sign and get on the ground. I mean, it's one thing to pretend that you're afraid of an open carrier. And so you get out and you start pointing your guns at people and order him on the ground. I'm not saying that that's the right, that's right, because it's not. But it's another when the person's carrying a sign. And you're you're threatening to kill them with a gun if they don't put the sign down. And then um, later, <clears throat> Jack has uh, another issue with uh, Almost Park, and and then you have Todd Ferguson and uh, Joanne, uh, backup camera girl, uh, getting. You know these guys are coming out there with their guns drawn, and uh, so we decided to go out there. We went out there to hold them accountable. I had contacted, we, we had decided to have a big rally out there and protest in April. But I wanted to go out there first and find out what was uh, what was the reality, what was the, the situation. Because, you know, Open Carry Texas does things a, a certain way. And, and generally, when, when we have an event, there's not really an issue. Yeah, we've had cops show up and, uh, you know, like especially up in um, is either San Angelo. Or, no, it was Abilene. Up in Abilene, <coughs> getting surrounded by officers. <coughs> you know, pointing, <coughs> pointing their guns at us. Um, <laughs> but they listened when we tried to de-escalate the situation. So we go down there, we decide, uh, you know, I pulled, I pulled a bunch of, after all these, this nonsense stuff, I want to find out what was going on. I, uh, I had called the chief to find out, okay, what, what is their understanding of the law? And the idea that I got was that the chief, I mean, he said it, we know that open carry is legal in Texas. Okay. Um, well, are you going to point guns at me if I'm open carrying? Well, that's a stupid question. I can answer that. Are you going to threaten to kill me? That's a stupid question. Are you going to tase me? That's a stupid question. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Am I back? Everybody good? Oh, you know what? Um, we've got that, uh, Hurricane Ida, I guess Tropical Depression Ida coming through. I might lose my, my signal. So let me just finish this. Then I'll be done. <clears throat> so uh, we go down there. Um, whew, here, let me take some deep breaths here. All right. I should be done in five minutes. And everything the chief says he was not going to do, 
he did. So, a uh, Zephyrus, I actually have throat coat tea, and <coughs> and I drink it uh, in the morning and then in the evening. I drink uh, throat coat tea. Um. Okay, everybody knows. <coughs> Everybody knows what happened. I don't want spark. Here's where we are today. Um, I tell you, this COVID thing sucks with the lungs. Just being able to breathe just sucks. Um, the case is still going forward. We got some great attorneys out of San Antonio, we are, uh, we've already gotten most of the depositions done. We, uh, I can't, and I can't get more specific than, than who we deposed and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, there have been motions filed. <clears throat> there have been motions filed by the defense. Uh, we just got a court order today. Now I can say these things because this is a public, if, if it's been filed, obviously it's, um, it's public record. So I'll say this. Um, when I was deposed, the attorney wanted to talk or ask me questions about the proud boys. Well, keep in mind, I was arrested March 27th. Yeah, March 27th, 2018. I didn't join the Proud Boys until July 2019. So over a year later. <clears throat> so my involvement with the Proud Boys had absolutely nothing to do with Almost Park. I wasn't a member of the Proud Boys. I wasn't considering being a member of the Proud Boys. I don't even remember if I knew what the Proud Boys was back then. I can't remember. So I, uh, I refused to answer questions during my deposition about the Proud Boys because it was irrelevant. It didn't matter. <laughs> and uh, so they uh, filed a motion to compel, to compel me to talk about the Proud Boys and my involvement uh, with the Proud Boys. The, and, and they also filed a motion on, uh, to compel me to talk about a, a whole bunch of other stuff uh, and to produce stuff. And we, we opposed all of it. And the only thing that the uh, the judge just said is that um, they are allowed to re-depose me and ask me specifically about uh, about the Proud Boys. And here's the, here. Let me find out what exactly it said. It said, uh, <clears throat> uh, "Here's where's the order." And again, I'm, I'm, I'm only saying this because it's, it's public record now, so uh, anybody can look at this. So plaintiff Christopher Grisham uh, must be made available for a deposition lasting no more than two hours regarding his membership in any Proud Boys organization and his agreement or disagreement with the tenants of such organization. And then the rest of the, uh, the motion was denied. So that's fine. I'll, that, that's where we're at today. Um, the, uh, the judge also set a, uh, a timeline. And again, this is public record. So I'm, I'm not, all I'm going to do is read from the public record. I'm not going to give any commentary, <clears throat> but, um, we were authorized to do a rebuttal expert and, uh, we have to designate that rebuttal expert on or before September 10th. Obviously, the defendants can uh, depose that expert that we get. And this is an expert on police um, on police actions. So that's going to be our expert witness. We've already got that person picked out. Uh, all discovery granted by this order uh, must be completed on or before October 22nd. So uh, the deposition and um, 
let me see if this says exactly because we had filed a counter motion because here it is. Plaintiffs uh, opposed motion for leave, motion to compel depositions, motion to show cause. Remember, we're the plaintiffs and uh, request for sanctions is granted in part, denied in part and denied without prejudice in part. So on or before September 10th, September 10th, almost park must produce to us all versions of the previously disclosed PowerPoint file that was created on or before March 27th. Uh, production of such file must be made in the file's original format. Thereafter, Defendant Chief Rene Valenciano must be made available for the deposition, lasting no longer than two hours regarding this PowerPoint file. Um, I don't know whether or not the PowerPoint file is in the public record yet, so I'm not going to talk about what that is, but um, we'll, this was evidence that was uh, kind of withheld from us. And so we got it. And then now we're like, wait a minute. Whoa, we got this after we deposed the chief. Uh, we would have liked to have talked to him about this. This is, this is a, this is a pretty damning argument or document right here. So <clears throat> uh, that's where we are on that. And then also, uh, so the, what we're, here's the, the big part here. Again, this is public. So I'm not giving any inside information or anything like that. Um, the parties must mediate this case on or before October 29th, 2021. So uh, we're supposed to go to mediation and we should have that mediation completed by October 29th. Hopefully uh, it results in what we're looking for as far as a, uh, you know, certain actions to be taken by the police department and, and settlement. And then after that deposition, we have another six days or so, seven days a week, um, to produce all of our dispositive motions on or before uh, November 5th. So by November 5th, we should have something that is finalized or we can at least uh, talk about as far as the almost part case. Um, but in some instances, there are, uh, there's gag orders. So I can't, that's why I only wanted to talk about and read what is in the public document, uh, because uh, there's I don't I don't know why my previous attorney did a gag order on certain aspects of this case. Uh, apparently, this was the gag order was approved back in February. And I didn't find out about it until about a week ago, you know, two weeks ago. Um. Thankfully, I hadn't been talking about it anyway, but um, yeah, so there we are. There, there, that's where we are in Almost Park. Uh, I am going to stop talking and give my lungs a break. <clears throat> hey, HBO Matt, so here's, well, I don't want to give away our strategy, but here's my philosophy in general. When it comes to constitutional violations and, and non-disclosures, if you want me to sign a non-disclosure, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Um, because I don't want this police department to be able to get away with what they did and not be held accountable. And, and I mean that in the public eye, to be held accountable in the public eye. So I've made clear to my attorneys that any settlement that includes a non-disclosure is, uh, you know, I've given them a number that's a high number, but also what we'd be willing to accept as a settlement if we did not have a non-disclosure. So in other words, if they want a non-disclosure, it's going to cost them. Because I, I should have a right to uh, to talk about my own case, what happened with it, and all of that. Now, if uh, you would like me to waive that right, by all means, you can pay me to waive that right. Um, I'm not in this for money, which is why I, I don't mind uh, 
you know, a different fee as long as there's no non-disclosure. But I'll tell you right now, any non-disclosure is automatically doubling, at least doubling anything we're willing to settle for uh, if there's going to be a settlement. I have no problems going to court at all over this. I'm not looking for a settlement. I'm not looking for money. I'm looking for justice. That's all I want is justice. And um, so I, I can't get into too many other details because I don't want to give the other side uh, any strategic or tactical advantage over what what kind of negotiations, uh, where my numbers are and, and all that kind of stuff. But all right, guys, I'm, I'm going to go because my throat is getting crazy. Uh, really quick, if you got any questions, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let's see, 126, three and a half minutes. So I'm going to stay on here three and a half minutes more. Uh, see if there are any questions in the chat. Um, if there are questions, I can answer them. Maybe I just need to put this cough drop in my mouth. I should have done that a long time ago. <clears throat> hey, thanks, Felix. Um, I'm feeling a lot better. You know, with the, it, it's weird because my wife and I both got COVID and it was completely different for both of us. For her, it was like, and again, put, put your, uh, if you've got a question, just put it in the chat there. For her, it was like a really bad, a really bad flu. Uh, she had, she had the uh, fever. She had fever. Uh, she had chills. Um, obviously, the the not as bad as mine, but you know, some coughing issues. Uh, her nausea, things like that. She she had it bad. All I got was. You know, suddenly it was like, because I had done a really long bike ride and uh, I thought the reason that I was starting to have like these chest pains was because I had just overdone it on my bike ride. And uh, so when she tested positive for COVID, I decided, oh, well, crap, I better go get tested at least. So I went and got tested and sure enough, I ended up uh, positive. But literally the only thing that uh that i got was just this this breathing thing there was one night i was you know i was really tired obviously i've been extremely extremely uh uh just exhausted and and tired and just no energy whatsoever and so there was one day i went to bed i was it was like five o'clock in the afternoon i'm like you know i'm just gonna go lay down and i ended up sleeping pretty much all all night next day. But at some point that night, my wife had come to bed and then she took my temperature and I was like 102 or three or something like that. So she gave me some stuff and, uh, th but that was it that, that night I had a fever. Um, by the morning it was gone and you know, literally the, the entire time, the biggest problem has been not being able to breathe and cough. And it got to the point where my my blood oxygen level scared the crap out of me. My blood oxygen level had gotten down to 75. I couldn't, I mean, I was starting to get dizzy. So I went to the ER. Um, you know, they pumped me. You know, they might have done Regeneron. I don't, I don't even know. Uh, but they started pumping me through with all this stuff. Uh, gave me some, gave me some different uh, vitamins and medications. And then I came home, I think it was uh, like Zithromax was one of them. And then uh, pretty much I've just been treating it with vitamins, zinc. Uh, I use melatonin as well. Uh, baby aspirin. Um, and so, I mean, I'm fine. I'm all good, but uh, I've, I've got to deal with the, the breathing issue. So it's kind of weird how COVID sort of affects everybody differently. Um, yeah, anyway. But I'm still not going to get the vaccine. <clears throat> I've got I've got more antibodies now than I would have if I got the vaccine. And I still would have gotten sick. And then what? Um, we do have ivermectin. We've got ivermectin on the farm. Uh, my aunt, after we told him uh, that... Now, keep in mind... You got to be careful with ivermectin, though, because, you know, there's animal uses and there's human uses. And you got to make sure you're you're not ODing on it because some people are just getting stupid about it. Uh, but I take I take vitamin D 
vitamin C, zinc, melatonin. I'm missing something. There's one. It's it's like quercerin, quercerin, que, quercerin, something like that. I don't know, but nope, not getting a COVID shot. I refuse to get the COVID shot. I'm not uh, an anti-vax kind of guy, but. Uh, you know, I don't even get the, uh, I didn't get the anthrax shot when I was required to get the anthrax shot. I fought that in the military and I'm glad I did because they eventually stopped giving the anthrax shot because of the problems it was causing. Um, I don't take the, uh, flu, the flu vaccine because I have such a great immune system. I never get sick. Um, and, but when I do get sick, it's really bad, which is very rare. So it's kind of nice that I rarely get sick, but when I do get sick, it kind of knocks me out. Um, but every time I took the flu vaccine, I would get sick and I'd be going, I'd be down for three days, just sick as a dog. And when I stopped getting the flu vaccine, I've never had the flu, never been sick. I, I might've had the flu, uh, but it's never been a big deal. Uh, so I don't take the flu vaccine and I'm definitely not going to take this, uh, this COVID vaccine when, you know, yeah, it's been approved now by the FDA, but the human trials aren't even done. I just don't trust new, new things, um, especially when it comes to medications and especially when it's become so political. It's just become so incredibly political that um, I, I just don't trust any of it. I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democrat or a, a Libertarian or anybody. I, I just I can't trust a vaccine that is being so forced upon everybody for a disease that is 99.7% you know, recoverable. Now, if, if you're one of those people, cause I know that, you know, this lung issue is bad. So obviously if you have, uh, you know, you might want to get the vaccine if you have like, um, asthma or some other types of, of issues. And I have no problems with people who get the vaccine. If you want to get the vaccine, get the vaccine. Um, but you know, with these spike proteins, the problem I have is, you know, these things attached to your blood vessels, You've got these spike proteins, they're little spikes that, that attach to your, your blood vessels. And now instead of this smooth, rounded uh, blood vessel where things are able to kind of move, you know, and pass over each other, you've got these little spikes sticking out of the blood vessels and it's catching on stuff. And, and, and stuff inside your bloodstream is starting to accumulate and that's causing people to get blood clots. And magnesium. There you go, Phoenix. That's the other thing I'm taking. Magnesium. Thank you. I knew there was something else I was taking. <clears throat> All right. Um, but, you know, my son's gotten the, uh, my son got the vaccine, but he also got sick after getting the vaccine. And so, you know, I don't care. Hey, if you want to get the vaccine, get the vaccine, but don't force it on me. If you don't want to get the vaccine, don't get the vaccine, but don't call other people stupid who do get the vaccine. Um, you know, this idea that COVID doesn't exist. I think it does. It's just a strain. It's a strain of the flu. Um yeah, exactly. It's like having burrs in your blood. And all it's doing is it's picking stuff up inside your veins, you know. <clears throat> all right. I'm done. Y'all take care. Um, I don't think I saw anything else here. Uh, Felix, please email me your address so I can send a truth DVD. Uh, I think I have your address, Felix. If not, just email me and I'll, I'll send you my address. And did you get the COVID shot? No. Yes, justice does come with restitution. All right. I'm out, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, hey, thanks, Skip. Yeah, man. Goodness, dude. You're making me sad. But uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look at your text. All right, y'all. Take care. Be safe. Be free.